Welcome to today's study of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Join Dr. Summerall as he shares with you the in-depth knowledge he's received from the Holy Spirit in over 60 years of ministry. Thank you. <clears throat> Can you imagine heaven given, giving gifts to the earth? We ought to be giving gifts to heaven for all the good things we have received. But, but heaven is giving us gifts. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the divine trinity, the Lord Jesus said, and when he is come, he will teach you all things. And so he has come and he has delivered gifts under the body of Christ, under those that love and serve him. And we have been looking at those gifts very strong for the last several months, really, I suppose. We are, are beginning right at this moment at page 78 in your teaching syllabus. And uh, we're speaking about a special gift that called the working of miracles. When you study the gifts of the Spirit, you will discover that these anointings and powers are manifest in other ways. For example, there's a gift of faith, but there's all kinds of faith, you see. And in miracles, there's all kinds of miracles. But this is a gift that God gives into a person who functions in an area of the miraculous it's a phenomenon. In your introduction, it says in the category of power, there are three categories of the gifts. This could be also called the category of energy. <clears throat> uh, it's so different from the category of revelation. The first three gifts are all revelation. The third three gifts are all inspiration. So you, you've got three distinct categories of operations here. And this one is in the category of, of a power or authority or energy, it says we deal with the gift of the working of miracles. A happening is only a miracle as far as man is concerned. That should be set apart in a paragraph all by itself. Uh, that it's only with you and me that it is a miracle, not with God. Uh, what you call a miracle don't mean a miracle with God at all. It's just his everyday operations, you see. Uh, God having all power a supreme power, uh, omnipotence. He does not recognize miracles as miracles, possibly as a blessing. What is a miracle to man is only an act with God. It is a miracle uh, with man because he would not be able to perform whatever this is, uh, cannot perform it by his own natural strength. Now, the Greek word uh, for, miracle, for the working of miracles is uh, energimatic, mata, uh, dunamion. From the first word, we derive our word energy. It says energy. You can see it pretty well there. And from the second word, we uh, receive our word dynamite. The second word is for miracles are dunamian. And it is the same word that is translated power in Acts 1 and 8, dunamis. Thus we could, we could say this is the gift of the energy of, of, of dynamite. If you don't know what the gift's all about, <clears throat> you wouldn't know it when it functioned. And so if you don't have some definition along with it, it could be functioning in some people's lives and they'd just say that was an incident or it was an accident or did it just happen. Uh, but with us, the things don't just happen, they divinely happen. And all the people said, we have in, in, in this an explosion of almightiness. That means we have reached beyond the human and the natural laws of nature and we have reached into another world. The gift of the working of miracles means a supernatural intervention of God in the ordinary course of our nature or of our lives in which we live. And this gift, God works through a man. Now you, sh you should draw a, a line under that. When it is a miracle, it means God has worked through a man and through some instrument that 
that man is functioning with. And now, in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 12 and verse 10, uh, we have the, beginning in verse 8, we have the, uh, the, the numeration of these gifts, uh, telling us what they are and, and how they function and so forth. And he says, and to another there is given a gift of the working of miracles. So now, we're not dealing with, actually with miracles, we're dealing with a gift. Uh, someone has a gift, and this gift produces things that are not ordinary, or they don't come in the area of natural phenomena. And, and so, when we get to that, we can see it. Now, this gift can function in, a, in most remarkable ways. I can hardly tell you why I put this point one down as point one. <laughs> it, it tells us that a dumb ass spoke in the language that a prophet could understand what he was saying. He spoke the language of the prophet. And Numbers chapter 22, verse 28 tells how a dumb beast who had never done anything but make a loud noise when he's hungry uh, spoke human words. Now you say, I don't believe it. That's your problem. The Bible is not full of lies. It happens to be full of truth. I don't know how about your mind, what it's full of. But the Word of God does not have lies in it. God was dealing with the nation of Israel. This prophet was going over to curse Israel with the curse of the devil to destroy the people of God after they'd been brought out of Egypt. And God says, I won't do it. God told this man not to go over there and prophesy at all because of the money of getting wealth, uh, selling his whatever gift he had, uh, a spiritist, uh, a person that uh, dealing in the spirit world, uh, he went on anyway. And so God gave a supernatural intervention, and the only one present to help was a donkey. Isn't that something? If he don't have a two-footed one, he'll use a four-footed one, you know? When he had nobody else to, 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 to work with, he worked with a rooster. Just, just so that, just so that Peter would know he was on the wrong road, completely on the wrong road, badly on the wrong road, and needed to change his way of living. But in this instant here, uh, in the book of Numbers, you find where this dumb beast began to speak and said, why do you hit me? Why do you knock me? Why, why do you do this? And, 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 then, and then God opened the eyes of the prophet and he saw an angel there with a drawn sword. He said, had not been for the donkey, I'd have killed you. And, and, and it says that uh, he, he stopped you. He even put your leg and threw it into a concrete uh, fence there. And, and uh, trying to stay out of my way so, so that I wouldn't kill both of you. And so God used this unusual situation, which you push, put in the area of miracles, you see. It's not normal for uh, a donkey to speak English or any other language. But God can do those things. And when they are done, it is a revelation of the omnipotence of God. Now, let's go to, to that one's in the Bible. Let's go to one that happens to be working with human persons. We'll go to David uh, first. When David slew a lion with his naked hands, no, no, no knife, no, no bow, no stones. He, with his naked hands, he took a lion and pulled his upper jaw against the lower jaw and cracked it and killed him. And that when he attacked a bear that had one of his lambs and killed that bear, a bear is a ferocious creature that will fight to the end. And, and so he grabbed the bear in his bare hands. It was the working of what we call a miracle. It was God putting something inside of his hands he had never had before. He didn't have that kind of strength normally. And of God showing him how to do it, where to do it, when to do it. And these, these strong beasts fell over dead under the hands of a human person. And that was a miracle. It was a miracle through a man. If he had stood off to one side and said, uh, bear drop dead, and that bear drop dead, 
that would be the functioning of faith because he did nothing, God did it. But if he grabs the animal and destroys him, then, then that is the functioning of a, of a miracle because his natural hands were not capable of slaying a wild beast. So God was functioning in a different way than he would if it was an operation of faith. You take Daniel in the lion's den, uh, the, the, when, he, when, when the king dropped him into the den of lions and they were all hungry lions and they were ready to destroy him, by the power of God, he says, you lie down, shut your mouths, and I'm gonna be here all night until tomorrow morning. And through a power, not a negative power, a positive power of believing that God was able to close up a lion's mouth, he just said, shut up and lie down. And it worked. But that was a function outside of him. He didn't, he didn't close anybody's mouth. He didn't kill any lions. Now, if they had dropped Samson into the same cave, you see, he'd have said, isn't this a beautiful opportunity here? He'd have grabbed those lions and begin to kill them. They would have been selling lion burgers all over, all over the city the next morning. He says, come eat a Samson lion burger. They're, they're, even, they're even better than McDonald's. And so uh, they would have been in business, you see. It would, have been a, it would have been a power of God either way, but one is working for you and one is working through you. Uh, and so uh, Mr. Howard Carter, that I lived with for a number of years, positively had th th this gift of faith functioning in him. He called into being things that you couldn't, you couldn't have them otherwise, you know? And I lived with him and was afraid of him. Uh, and uh, I knew I was living in a glass house when he looked at me. Uh, and, and so, uh, uh, I, but he didn't have this working of miracles thing, you see. He, owned, he had the gift of faith functioning inside of him. He was a tender, quiet man. And he had this gift of faith functioning inside of him. And uh, I, I presume a book should be written about it. I asked his widow after he passed away if I could have his diary. And she said, no, now she's dead. And, and, and uh, her son is dead. So we don't, know, uh, we don't know where they went. But it would be so interesting because he made meticulous notes of everything that happened in his life. And uh, right from the time he, he was converted. But here, here you find David working in the area of miracles. Now you see, but that's in the Old Testament. Uh, there are nine of these gifts. Seven of them function in the Old Testament. Only two function new. And that's the gift of tongues and the gift of the interpretation of tongues. Those are the only two gift, new gifts in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, it seems that God came upon those men. But in the New Testament, he resides. He resides in there. The Holy Spirit resides in there. And I think these things function in a, in a more remarkable way in the New Testament than even in the Old Testament. But we have the stories, and, and Paul told us that these things were written that we might understand, that we might believe, and they're written for our admonition. They're not in there just you know, to fill up the book. Uh, they are in there that you and I might receive spiritual strength from them and, and faith. If God did it for them, then God can do it for us. So God wants us to function in an area of understanding and believing in order that these things might come to pass in our own lives. As you turn the page, we come to the gentleman that we just mentioned named Samson. Now, Samson was born in a miraculous way uh, and uh, was, a, was a Nazarite. And God began to move upon him and he became accepted as a judge. <clears throat> now, in the book of Judges, we do have a few pages there on Samson, but we certainly don't have his full life. We don't have one instance of him sitting in judgment that, that's there. He was a judge of Israel and we don't have one in, instance of a judgment seat to where he began to, to give judgment to the people. Uh, about all we have are his adventures. You, wouldn't you hate to have a president and the only record you had left of him was his adventures on the golf course? Hole in one. 
you see. And so with Samson, we, we do not have him sitting in courts and, and sitting as the judge of it, but he was the judge of Israel. So uh, he was the, the political head of Israel, <clears throat> and I presume the spiritual head of Israel. And, and so uh, uh, he was a, a great man. He, he was a judge of Israel, and the Bible tells us that on an occasion he took a lion with his naked hands and that he slew the lion. And then the Bible says that the enemies came to take him as a prisoner and to kill him and that he slew a thousand men with a jawbone of an ass. That they, they, they found an old carcass of a, of, a, of a dead animal and he grabbed that thing and began to hit those men that had swords and spears and destroyed a thousand of them. I, I can see him jumping clear over the heads of people over to another area and another area uh, until they didn't know where he was. They thought there were a thousand men and there's only one. And, and he, he destroyed them. Now that is not normal. That is not natural. <laughs> Nobody can do that unless the holy anointing of God comes upon you. And then you become another person all together and you can do things. You say, well, why don't we have those today? Well, in a lot of places we do have these today. And I, I'm sorry to have to tell you that most of it is in primitive areas. It, it's in areas where people are not in a hurry. They don't have to have lunch at 12.30. They likely don't have any lunch at all. In Russia, I am sure that if you start getting a hold of the miracles that will be taking place over there, there'll be stories that'll match anything in the Bible. You say, why? When you preach for three hours, they say, that's a nice testimony. When are you going to preach now? They will come to church in the early morning and stick right there all day long and don't grumble, don't growl, and don't go anywhere. You say, why? There's a hunger in their hearts at this moment. Communism left them so empty so absolutely empty, left them so empty until they're trying to get full of the Word of God. And the more you teach the Word of God, the better, the better they like it. And they're in no hurry. Did you know you can get more from God when you're not in a hurry? God's not going to slow you down. You got to slow yourself down. Do you know what you hear from preachers all over the country today more than you hear about anything else? They say, I have got so much to do. And, and I'm an irritant to them. I says, just t t tell me what you have to do. And they don't know, you see. The secretary's already done it all. Did you know the devil can put something in your mind that you're busy and, and you're not busy? You know what I tell preachers and they say, oh, I am so busy. I say, oh, no, no, you're not busy. You're confused. Now let's go back and straighten it out. Can you remember what you did yesterday? They can't remember what they did yesterday. You see? They just know they're busy. Did you know that anybody who says they're busy are disorganized? You see why? You can do one thing at a time, do one thing at a time. If you were to walk into my office, you would find that sometimes in 30 minutes time, I deal with about four areas of the whole world sometimes involving hundreds of thousands of dollars, and shift gears from Europe to Africa to Asia just, just in a second's time and make a decision on that. Now, I could, I could yell out, I'm busy, but these men are sitting here today that work in our office, they've never heard me say, I'm busy. You say, why? Well, because I'm not busy, you know. I'm doing the work that I ought to do. I'm doing it on schedule, and I'm doing it slowly, and I don't back up. You know, if you're going to take one little decision and change it about 40 times, it's going to take a lot of your time, you know. But when I make a decision, I don't want to discuss it anymore. That one's finished. Let's go make another decision. You say, what if it's bad? Well, get somebody else in the job. You're not qualified. Are you here or not? God wants us to slow down. He wants us to be quiet. He wants us to seek his face. And, and when we do, these things can begin to take place in our lives. 
It is a remarkable thing to me that when I get quiet, I sat in an automobile for about an hour yesterday by myself. And it was so refreshing inside of me to move into the Word of God as, as I was waiting for someone, just, just to let the Word of God open the Bible here and open the Bible there, look for this scripture and that scripture, including some of the stuff for the sermon that you're going to hear this morning. You're going to hear a remarkable sermon this morning. You say, well, what is it? it, it it's called Your Friend, Your Friends, The Angels. And I'm going to show you how they're your friends. And, 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 and some of you never climb a fence to get acquainted. Are you here? If you don't seek after God, you're going to die just like you are now. About two-thirds spiritually bankrupt. If you don't get your mind on something else besides material things, you're not going to have the anointing of God upon your life. If you're more disturbed about the brakes on your car than you are about receiving the gifts of God, all you got's brakes. God will not intervene in your busy life. It's worth nothing. You only have about three decisions in your whole life that's important. One is getting saved, the other is getting married, and the other is dying. Between that you do a little bit. Are you all right today? I just want to be sure. The same man, Samson, here dislocated the pillars of a giant temple. There were 3,000 people on the roof. 3,000 people. It must have been an enormous temple. And thousands of people were there worshiping an image called Dagon. And through the power of God, this man got between those two pillars that held up that roof and he shook it. And he shook it with, his, with just a little man. Five foot four, you know. That whole concrete and stone building came tumbling down. And though he had seen thousands of people die in his warfare throughout his life, he destroyed more people in his death than he did while he lived. The Bible says that. That in his death he destroyed more people. You know, I often tell people that it might be that in your death you'll do more for God than you've ever done before. You're going to finally give God what he wants, you know. You, you call it a will. But remember, remember, you don't get any in any good things from a will because you held it as long as you could selfishly. A will means that you lost it, you know. And you say, well, I can't have it, God. I throw it to you. God doesn't catch junk like that. If you want God to love you, give it to him when you can see it be done. Can you say amen? Oh, I'm afraid. That's what I thought, full of fear. And, and God's full of love and faith, and so it don't mix very well. Here's a man that did such an amazing thing. Now, you find all of this in Judges chapter 14, verse 6, Judges 15 and verse 15, Judges 16, uh, 29, 30. It'd be good uh, to read how a simple man, and that after he disobeyed the covenant, say covenant, after he disobeyed the covenant, he couldn't do a thing. He was just like other men. And so, Miracles happen through this person. And then, your point number four, it is the same spirit working within us for all the gifts. The difference between the gift of faith and the gift of the working of miracles is that with the gift of faith, God does everything. While in the gift of the working of miracles, God uses man to bring about a phenomena that is not possible in his own strength. So you say, what do we do, Brother Summer? You start praying for these gifts. We could spend one whole lesson in what the Bible says here on how to receive these gifts. The Bible gives you the, you know, it, it tells you how to get these gifts. All you got to do is read three chapters. That's 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 13, and 1 Corinthians 14. And when you read those three chapters, you'll find there how these gifts can come to function and operate. Now, in these last days, in these last days, 
God is going to function in the mighty gifts of God. He will function in them. He may not function in your area because you don't qualify. But as sure as you're here, you may have to go to some primitive part of the world to see the mighty gifts of God function. People that don't own a car never did own a car. People that don't know what a refrigerator is, they've never seen one. But they know one thing. They know how to pray. They know how to believe the Word. They know how to accept the Word. And then they, they know how to command God. God, do this. And the Spirit of God begins to move, and it's done. I'm ready for God to move. How about you? I'm ready for God to move. These are the last days. And we want to see the total function of the gifts of the Holy Ghost. All of them. All of them. Say all of them. Not just part of them. And so they belong to you and they belong to the body. They belong to you as a person and you function inside the body and in that way they bless the total body. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand, everybody. They will not function in unbelief. They will not function in bitterness. They will not function in backbiting until you have respect for the Word of God and for those who teach the Word of God. You're just going to be bumping on an empty door. Let's get on inside and let God bless us. And all the people said, Amen. praise God forever. Well, we, we're going to uh, be t teaching this coming lesson on the gifts of healing. It is possibly the most uh, difficult of all the gifts to speak about. And so we will be getting into that. The gifts, the gifts of healing. Notice it has an S. It is more than one. They're gifts of healing. Uh, as there were 39 stripes on Jesus' back, there might be 39 gifts. We're going to study it and see what God has for us. But we know one thing. There are a lot of people who need healing. There are a lot of people that need healing. But you cannot live a carnal, natural life and move into the supernatural just when you care to or want to. You've got to live in the Spirit in order to function in the Spirit. And all the people said, Amen. that you've been blessed by today's program. For more information about Dr. Summerall's teaching or to request audio or video cassettes of today's program, please write to Lucie, Box 12, South Bend, Indiana, 46624, or call 219-291-1010. Please refer to the program number on the screen when corresponding. Thank you.